Billy. You. Billy, we've already told me off. Let's move on. You're tacky and I hate you. Okay, you see me after class. Movies have never been bereft in con men and hustlers, characters who manipulate those around them in order to fulfill their wants. On paper, School of Rock is a movie about a con and identity theft, a man posing as his roommate in order to use school children to help him score a $20,000 payout. And thanks to Jack Black, this con became a celebration of otherness and potential. Through the actor's charm and wonder, the lines blurred between whether we were watching Dewey Finn or Jack Black. Now, if you have some time between face-melting solos and gut-busting drum fills, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel in order to stay up to date on all of our latest videos. Let's get rockin'! Director Richard Linklater has no clear line of filmmaking. He directed experimental pictures such as Waking Life and teen classics like Dazed and Confused. But in 2003, he helmed what would become a wildly celebrated comedy that appeals to both kids and adults, thanks mostly to its lead, Jack Black. One common thread in Linklater's work is his dedication to realism. From his debut Slacker to the wonderful Before trilogy, he's eschewed surrealism in favor of believable characters and circumstances. When casting School of Rock, he wanted real kids playing real instruments. Every actor is also a musician in their own right. This takes the movie one step further than the pantomiming performances other films of this ilk usually trek. The screenplay was written by real-life friend and former neighbor of Black, Mike White. White read the scripts Black was being offered after the breakout role of High Fidelity, and White read the same cliched roles of Belushi-esque party animals and knew his friend was capable of more. He knew there was a unique tenderness to Black, one that revolved around not just Black's love of music, but the way it could transform people. You've been focused so hard on making it, you forgot about one little thing. It's called the music! When the movie begins, we learn that Black's character, Dewey Finn, has been leeching off his roommate and friend, Ned Schneebly, for years. After a chance phone call, Dewey poses as Ned in order to take a job as a substitute. To begin, he is mostly going through the motions. More than anything, he treats it like a babysitting gig, just a box to tick before he can collect the checks. He tells the students he's hungover and to just enjoy recess. Who knows what that means? Doesn't that mean you're drunk? No, it means I was drunk yesterday. Even here though, as we watch the cliched trope of the gruff adult who wants nothing to do with kids, Black is still somehow likable throughout the interactions with the more upper class kids. In lesser hands, it might come across as manipulative. Dewey has only ended up at the school because he needs money to avoid being evicted. After overhearing the kids play during music class, he concocts a plan to put a band together in order to win a battle of the bands and its sizable cash prize. Black is able to tap into an exhausted charm that is more Walter Matthau in Bad News Bears than Billy Bob Thornton's angry turn as the same character in the film's remake. What Black understands is the idea that these kids are not the problem. They aren't an obstacle in his way that he must overcome. They are simply an annoyance he must put up with until he's paid. That simple difference means everything, and it makes the plots shift into working with the children that much more believable. There's an infectious enthusiasm you can't help but fall in love with, and that's abundantly clear as he begins to dole out roles for the band. After piano prodigy Lawrence plays a few notes of The Doors' Touch Me, Black sings along and then stops him to say, Stop! That's perfect. You're perfect. Stay right there. There's a steady eye contact here, a big and broad smile that makes us feel safe. We immediately lose the thread that this moment is a manipulation. In the back of our minds, we may remember that he's only putting this band together in order to further his own ones, but in our hearts, we know he believes that behind these 88 keys, Lawrence is perfect. It carries on throughout the rest of the scene as well. He brilliantly places energy-riddled Freddy behind a drum set, and he coins what every metalhead would subconsciously reference when they answer the phone. Hello, you've got a bass. Try it on. Part of what makes just this segment of the film work is the way Dewey pivots to address every kid's want. After Summer discovers what a groupie actually is, Dewey immediately appeases her by promoting her to band manager. What is at first a means to keep her quiet becomes a genuine working relationship as the movie progresses and its inevitable end. It's also wonderful in its endearing honesty, even if that honesty stems from a lie. And for a movie like this to work, one based around deception, we have to love the deceiver. 
We sincerely love watching Dewey take care of these children. We are not given much backstory to Dewey, but thanks to the entire team here, what we are given is quick and efficient storytelling. When the movie opens, we see Black barrel through an eye-roll-inducing solo as the rest of his former band waits for him to finish. When his stage dive falls flat and Dewey crashes to the floor, we know this guy. He's the band member who can't read the room. He wants the crowd to experience something only he can really see. But in Black, we still love him. Part of that is his relentlessness. As a master of physical comedy, Black has a perfect understanding of how his body moves and works. His eyes go wide, his smile stretches for miles, and his weird shanty dance mixed with power stance somehow becomes enviable. Throughout the entire movie, we're treated to dichotomic scenes of encouragement and trickery. Freddy, that was awesome. You're rocking, but it's a little sloppy Joe. Tighten up the screws, okay? When singer Tamika confesses to Dewey that she's nervous about being judged for her weight during her solo, she's quickly reaffirmed by her teacher. It's these tiny slips from exploitation to unabashed avalanches of compliments that only someone like Black could pull off. And credit must be given to Link later in knowing the power he wielded with Black. When they wanted to use Immigrant Song for a small sequence, everyone involved knew how hard this would be as Led Zeppelin was infamously standoffish in regards to their music. So Link later had Jack Black film a plea from the climax scene stage in order to sway the band. Lords of Rock Led Zeppelin! Lords of Rock Led Zeppelin! Grace us with your mighty love! We see here the blurred line between Black and Dewey. It's easy to imagine our fictional proxy doing the same thing. While some actors fill their roles with subtle nuance and gentle transitions, Black is a rally car. He quickly snaps gears from role model to just another one of the kids in every sharp turn. Part of that abruptness stems from his background in the alternative comedy scene. For a lot of us, Black might always be the farmer slash devil of Mr. Show with Bob in David's Barnhouse musical, but the ability to move so deftly was always there. Evident in that sketch alone as Black transitioned from meekish farmer to sin-encouraging demon. It's a skill he's mastered throughout his career. When Black began Tenacious D with guitarist and fellow comedian Kyle Gass, they alternated between opening for Tool and small comedy festivals. It's a large canvas he's painted upon because people seem to genuinely love being around the actor. Throughout the entire movie, he lifts those around him wanting each to be a metal god just like him. We can tell through Black's spastic performance that he's not looking at the same world we see, and he desperately wants to share this with us. You're a rock star now. All you gotta do, you just gotta go out there, just rock your heart out. People are gonna dig you, I swear. Black, and by proxy Dewey, is forever the kid drawing pentagrams into a spiral-bound notebook. He daydreams about riding dragons over rivers of blood with an axe-guitar hybrid, simply because the words sound so cool. In different hands, Dewey Finn would have been, at best, a lovable loser. But in Black's hip-swaying shuffle and wailing falsetto, we have a metal god using their deification to inspire. Let us know down in the comments below some other metal icons from your favorite movies. Thanks so much for watching, and while you're here, why not poke around the channel to watch some of our other videos?